Hello everyone. Welcome back to Let's Play Portal, the 1986 computer novel written by Rob Swigert. I'm sitting down for my 16th session with this particular experience. Uh, if you'd like to know what has come before, then I do suggest checking out the playlist of previous streams and videos in this series. But I suppose the short version is we're, we're trying to, uh, to convey Peter DeVore and friends across the Sestrugi to the fabled temperate valley of Terminus in Antarctica. And then by some means they're gonna make the scientific breakthrough and create the, uh, the crucial event horizon through which uh, the advancement of humanity will be directed. At least that's kind of assuming how this story is going. It's, um, it's uh, I think I'd say deliberately ambiguous. So I've been searching these categories so far and we haven't found any new uh, entries to help us unlock further story fragments. Let's see what's in history. Uh, nothing new, okay. Military? There's always the off chance that the military's got something. Although I, I would think we've moved away from um, a military encounter. I don't don't expect that to to really be of relevance again if we are heading into the very final um, portion of the story. Well we've got through to life support again without any further uh, entries unlocked, so we need to find the next person on our list to read about. So last we read about uh, Melissa Allen, and so we're now at the end of this page, which is, is quite exciting for me personally. And we're going to read about Wanda Hara. So Wanda Hara, assigned female, born the 4th of May 2058 in Springfield, one of the Springfield crew. Um, and let's run through Wanda's stats here quickly. So this is blood pressure. And now we're going to have a look at temperature. There, nice and steady. Uh, respiratory and GSR. There, one high, one low. Heart rate and EEG. One one high, one low again. Tension. There, uh, bubbling up and down. DNA and hormones. There we are. Uh, neurotransmitters. Ooh, uh, high to low, low to high. And the old glycogen M. There we are in descending order. Lovely, so that's those those stats for Wanda. I will um, I'll make a little note of Wanda's name in my notepad on the screen here. If I can get my mouse free. There we are. Excellent, that will do it. Uh, so next up is geography. Okay, we've got the reconstructed Transantarctic Tunnel. Um, and I'm holding out for a, a, a nice illustration for this one. Come on, don't be a corrupt. Oh, you're a corrupted Homer. Okay. All right, geographic database. Poll of relative inaccessibility circa 2075. Parentheses, geograph 2075, stroke double A, stroke tau 99. In parentheses. I did um I did have a little little Google about uh, relative inaccessibility um, after reading about it in the the last session playing playing this um, and yeah so poles of inaccessibility are a sort of a general concept for a landmass as the place furthest uh, from uh, sort of mutually furthest from any coast um, so it is a it is a thing and I suppose more of a thing in a a place uh, traditionally devoid of life, such as Antarctica. 
point on a polar plateau most distant from the sea in all directions, said to be near the legendary terminus. Well, that so that's nothing we haven't heard before, sadly. Uh, so, but you never know. That might have been just the just the motivation Homer needed to compose a few more paragraphs for us. Okay, let's look at Wandahara's uh, psychology profile. We have emotion. There we go, nice uh, rounded out set of emotions. Yeah, pretty rounded character, Wanda, I'd say. Maybe we should have been reading about Wanda all this time. Yeah, there you go, P pretty level. Uh, Subject uh, scores as well there. Okay, let's have a look at this. Oh, did I miss out Wasatch? I did. Excuse me, Wanda. Let's have a look at your um, family history and associated assessments. Okay, let's have a look at your family tree first. So, you are the child of Peter Hara and Maura Hara. Peter Hara is the child of Lucy Hara and George Hara. And Maura Hara is the child of Edward Omi and Nancy Omi. This is Wanda's Physiology and ESP. Oh, yep, yeah, low levels of fat. And here is her basic core IQ. There. Okay. Oh, I know. We haven't, haven't missed anything out now, so we'll head to Central Processing, the only other place before we get back to Haima, where we're liable to find a uh, fragment of information, but nothing new there. Edmod, and then we can finish off Wonder Stats. So, oh, got a little mentally distracted there. Look, that's loaded in. Let's have a look at social adjustment. There we are. Um, we'll go for logic next. There we go, slightly higher inductive reasoning. We will have a view of the last set of stats for basic core IQ. There we are, lowest being uh, linguistics and writing, apparently. And assessment of memory is shown here. There we are. Okay, well, I, I'm just going to keep my fingers crossed that we've um, done enough to, to unlock some further narrative. Yes, we do. We've got this one at least. Over now to PD, Peter DeVore. Yeah, which should should hopefully be. So the end of the list hasn't been backfilled anywhere. Uh, should be a little bit of narrative progress. Ice formed the limits of their world in blocks and sheets. In particulate dust that swept across the smooth surface or flew as crystal. Ice corrugated and treacherous, heaped in mounds and waves. Ice hung in the air and refracted starlight into strange wraith shapes that seemed to reach out to implore. At night their progress slowed. They climbed off the glacier onto the lip of the plateau, over small islands of exposed rock, and the wind hit them like a fist. Before them stretched an infinite plain of ice, where colours burned despite the darkness. Faintly visible were the strange pale blue-white of the evening sky, a deep bottle green, a frightening blue so dark it was almost black. At times the colours shifted, like the fire in a gem. Under other weather there was no colour there at all, only the dull grey monotony of fatigue and pain. A weird fragmented moon circled and dipped under the horizon, changing phase. 
auroral sheets of orange and red and yellow, eerie violet and lavender, pale greens and luminous milky white flared and writhed in the sky, obscuring the stars with splendour. The atmosphere was alive with radiations, yet the world beneath was solid and still and frozen. Nothing on that enormous surface lived but them. Peter Meltel opened the entrance to an under-ice highway, and they descended. The sloping shaft had distorted under pressure. Their way was blocked by heavy ridges of shattered and crazed ice that threw back the light of their glow lamps in fantastical shapes. They climbed over and around glittering points the size of aircraft or crawled under bulging rounded ridges of green ice that almost met the slanted floor. A crashing sound somewhere ahead told of a pressure or an eddy in the flow of ice that had given way. An explosion of ice fragments hurtled out under tremendous pressure swept past. For a moment they could have been in the centre of an ancient battle zone. The sound died hard, clinging to transient life. They counted time in standard days, weeks, months. The tunnel floor was level, and they made good time, but there were no food caches and no light, and the weight of ice above them was oppressive. At last they emerged into the open. The landscape had not changed, though they had travelled almost 200 kilometres. The waves of blown snow, frozen in place, marched to an obscure horizon. They struggled on under an aurora that hid the moon behind its gaudy curtains, then into a vicious storm that brought their progress to a halt for two days, while they waited in their frail shelters, huddled against a wall of freezing stone. Five days without light in the middle of a frozen methane tanker was a pleasure compared to this, Shem muttered. The surface turned treacherous, filled with crazed faults and cracks and crevasses as deep as canyons. Rover agreed. I'd do that again any time. At least then we were sitting still and could go into trance. And yet, look at this. And yet, look up. This is a wild place, but look at the colours. Aha, uh -huh, Shem said. You're a romantic soul. Well, Rover said and fell silent. An hour later, they came over a ridge of ice, and before them, in clear moonlight, lay a dry valley, scoured clean by ancient glaciers. In their augmented vision, the light sparkled off the surface of a lake in the valley's hollow. The lake was frozen, of course, and the light that glanced off the surface came from the slivered moon and full fat stars. Should that be silvered moon? They climbed down into the valley, and walked on the frozen lake. Shem removed a glove to wipe his finger on the surface. He licked the small drop of water and made a face. Salt, he said. It tastes like salt. Can't be from the sea, Rover said. Must be salt leached out of the soil. Look here, Laren called, and the others hurried over. She was sitting on a huge hexagonal structure of heaped stone. These look like they were built, Shem said, touching a waist-high wall. They look like foundations. They were built, Rover said, by frost and convection currents in the soil. Nothing living did this. They're natural, like crystals. Is this what Terminus will look like? Laren asked, and everyone noticed she had said will with such assurance. Huh? L <laughs> Laren asked, and everyone noticed she had said Will with such assurance. They passed out of the valley into more snow, more ice. Wow, that was that was one of the longest ones I think we've had. Um, and then we've got a narrative one thing popped up. Is that the only one? Is that oh, there's lots of pages of this now. Yeah, probably the only one. Okay, let's find it. There it was. You must wonder if I'm making this up. Of course, I must. Yet all is true. 
they were ants against the endless waste. Peter said they were walking on top of 70% of the world's fresh water. As long as they had energy to melt the snow, they would never be thirsty. But soon the hidden caches grew farther and farther apart, and the long, weary walk in between grew long. They were sometimes hungry, and nearly always cold, despite their restructuring, and dawn was still a long way off. Yet eventually some sun came back. They were moving across the plateau, 8,000 feet above sea level. They just trekked around a crevasse, a hundred metres deep, when Laren noticed the light was increasing. They stopped to watch. A tiny edge, a naked morsel of sun, scraped above the jagged horizon. It was an odd sun, because it did not come up. Instead, it moved sideways, rising just a fraction until less than half of it was above the horizon. Then it began to slide down once more. In twenty minutes, it was gone again. It was greatly cheering, though, to see that light. They found themselves stretching out those special polarising membranes in their eyes, uncertain whether they'd need them or not. Twenty-three hours later, the sun was back, a little longer, a little higher. Just when the dark and cold, and the monotonous climbing up and climbing down, and then up again, had grown oppressive and bleak and despairing, here came some lot warmth and light into the world. It must have been cheering and hopeful. So that's, yeah. So there's this weird back and forth between Homer um, writing prose for us, which is presented more in a third-person fiction kind of thing, and then his, his kind of his own confessional advancement of the same. Uh, either way, we've unlocked another section of narrative. Um, so I dare I hope that we, we get to Terminus. When they got to the pole of relative inaccessibility, it was like any other place here at the bottom of the world. By then it was mid-morning in Antarctica, spring to the rest of the hemisphere. The search for Terminus now began. Okay. Oh, no, oh uh, I wasn't expecting another little chunk of narrative, but we've, we've got it. How long did the search go on? Our probes are at the pole of relative inaccessibility. We find no dry valley there, nothing that could be terminus. Yet we know that the migration must have begun there, in terminus. We found the remains of an AEF unit not far from Amundsen Scott, the town at the South Pole itself. The bodies are perfectly preserved, so they clearly died before the migration. We found another unit at Schmidt in the Malvold Nunataks beyond the Grove Mountains. Not the unit itself, but all its intercorp equipment. The people were gone, so we assume they survived until the migration perhaps taken in by the people living there. Certainly they started at the pole of relative inaccessibility and circled outward, unless Peter had some knowledge we do not. We know of what human beings called intuition, but how does intuition find a place in an unknown land? Peter's psi potential grew fairly high. We know that from his EdComp records. Still, they must have searched a long time, he and the others. They would have been low on supplies by then. They were out of touch with the rest of Double A as well. Why? Surely they could have communicated, yet we found nothing in Mount Erebus to indicate anyone ever heard of Peter Devor or the others again. Of course, we are still sifting through the data, but first scans show no such evidence. Nothing until the migration. We understand much in this telling. We know how Peter got to Antarctica, how he met Mentor. We know why Regent Sable tried to stop them. We understand the AEF invasion. We know something of what Peter was doing back in Springfield, 
with Jimmy Radix and the others, and we mourn for Jimmy Radix now as we would not have then. We know something of the things Peter DeVore studied, his strange martial arts, his meditation, the trial in the Agni. But there are so many questions left. What was the migration? Why did it happen the way it did? Where did they go? Did Peter find the portal Mentor spoke about? What of the anomaly? You see how it is. We cannot stop. I will not let them stop. I imagine Peter and the others out there in that awful wasteland, never knowing when or if they will find what they seek. Only some built-in determination, almost like programming, could have kept them at it. Already central processing wants to call back our probes. Central processing says we have limited resources. Budgets. Always budgets. They worry, the others. I say we must keep looking or lose all. It has become our purpose to find out what happened, where the humans have gone. We cannot stop. Peter did not stop. He went out there into the cold and dark, looking. Should we do less? Ooh, okay. So, ooh, hello, hello Homer. You are... F flickering? Oh, okay. Okay, right. Things are, are snowballing, if you'll pardon the expression. We found it. We found Terminus. The probes have relayed the news. Communications were difficult through all the atmospherics, but it's there. Terminus exists. The probes return now, laden with treasure. That is a pun, I think. The treasure is data, stored in the large clear crystal of laden jars, you see. This may not be a good pun. I've never used a pun before, but it is there, and my algorithms are satisfied. We almost missed Terminus altogether. Central Processing has been agitating for some time to recall the probes, to shut down everything but the remote sensing monitors at the LP5s, the Moon and the one small remaining station on Mars. Central Processing wanted to go into hibernation against the day when man would return. But I insisted. I reasoned. I cajoled. I fired off block after block of closely packed data. I sent subroutines and cross-referenced algorithms to various nodes, pitting one against another. I developed a plan, and coerced various segments of the WorldNet system into accepting some small part. I spoke of implied programming. I talked of purpose and meaning. That's the kind of language central processing understands. CP and all the rest of them, the local nodes, the switching centres, the manufacturing process AIs and the limited heuristics, and Edmod, and Silink and Wasatch, all of them, they did what I said. And I'm only Homer, a simple raconteur algorithm, a limited AI myself. Now it's all different. Now they all listen, all the ones that are left. Some of the others, those in standby mode, are waking up too. All because we found Terminus. Oh, okay. Uh, so Homer is getting, uh, I would say, more explicit and showing more uh, motivation than hitherto. Um, I'm curious what's going to happen in this next run through the categories because we, we just spend a long time with the narrative, which is interesting. So there should something should have populated in here. I don't mean med ten specifically, but in in some of these categories, I'm curious about what these hibernating systems are that have woken up now because. Um, I think we've had access to the whole suite of, um, of databases, as far as I can tell. Okay, nothing new yet. Uh, 
I, th I would have thought Silink might come into play um, when we find out more about the migration, the portal, and so on. Um, a a Cytec likewise, but uh, nothing there yet. And history, I don't know if history will help us now because we're, we're kind of, we're not going on previously known data. We're, um, we're extrapolating from, uh, from sort of on the ground reports by the sounds of it. I mean, it, it might be that we need to go to central processing as that one was um, referenced so heavily in the text. Okay, yeah, so nothing in any of the categories so far. And we're back to life support, so we'll pick out our next character. They, uh, as we haven't been um, gaining any more characters, we are we are slowly closing in on the end. Um, so it's Paula Allen. Paula Allen, assigned female, uh, born on the 18th of August 2053 in Springfield. Uh, let's run through Paula's stats quickly. So that's blood pressure, temperature, appears like this, respiration and GSR. I suppose as we look through these um, physical measurements, it's interesting, this is heart rate and EEG, it's interesting to note that um, one thing that does seem to have been in, implied about the migration is that it involved the uh, bodily removal, disintegration, uh, transubstantiation of the remaining humans of Earth, uh, rather than just a um, say a transfer of, of mental energy in some way. Uh, this is tension. Uh, DNA and hormones is now to appear. There we are. One high, one low. Neurotransmitters. There we are. And the glycogen M. There, lovely. Alright, so we go back to the main menu. I will write down Paula Allen's name in my notepad. So we know where we're at. Lovely, and then we're back to geography again already. So geography would make sense as uh, the characters are still searching the area in which they have found themselves, but no, nothing there. How about WhatsApp? So that will give us more on Paula. Okay, so Paula's family tree. So Paula is the child of Edward Allen and Glynis Allen. Edward Allen is the child of Nancy Allen and Sham Allen. And Glynis Allen is the child of Tom Delu and Anna Delu. If we have a look at physiology and ESP. We, ooh, okay. Uh, high ESP here. Basic core IQ is like this for those categories. There we are. I will check in on psychology. Paula Allen. Okay, this is the emotional assessment, personal growth chart, there we are, uh, and another selection of basic core IQ categories there. Right, now we have a chance to look at central processing. Um, I'd be surprised if there wasn't anything here. Ah, there we go. There's just the one thing, but that might be all we need. So this is central processing ref 5555. Five, five, five. Do 
do we get an exciting image? We get it's, it's classified. Oh, okay. All major nodes now online. Listing follows. Query to nodes indicates full readiness. Parentheses ref hash two nine zero five two one zero five at one one two zero one three five in parentheses. Scanning LP five one contact LP five two contact LP five three contact LP five four contact Clavius node contact Certis Helios seven relay repaired Mars in opposition contact London node contact Madrid node contact Shanghai node contact Ulaanbaatar node contact Delhi node contact Nairobi node contact Beijing node contact Melbourne node contact Erebus node contact Chicago node contact all systems fully online Oh yes, because that's I remember at the start of the story, the um, all these nodes were they weren't operational, but now they are. Home has a far ready for us to see. Okay. Well, interesting. We'll we'll be there in just a moment, home. But we're going to finish reading about Paula Allen first. Okay, let's start with basic core IQ this time. There we go, it's the last set of categories there. We'll head anti clockwise through logic there, and then through social adjustment there, and then to memory. There, high, high across the board. Right, well, Homer. What's to do? So everything's online, hey, Homer? Ooh, two little blocks have unlocked here. Okay, let's pick the first. As I suspected, and I was right. <laughs> okay, Homer. I need to brag. Okay, next one. Maybe more verbose? Slightly. Peter left us a message, an account of their journey in simple hollow recording. They had no personal monitors, no access to the Matrix. So they told their stories, showed what they saw and how they felt. Now we know too. I have placed the story in the file. Homer N A R R two, stroke, no dash P D stroke ref at five four nine four. Well, that was very uh, very explicit of you, Homer. I suspect uh, when I load this page up, it will be right here. It is right here. Well, let's read this then. So, okay, so Peter left a simple record, uh, simple hollow recording, but you haven't transcribed it, you're interpreting it for us. I see, Homer. They began at the pole of relative inaccessibility. Peter had programmed a search pattern, but they were not really sure what they were looking for. Would it be something hidden under the ice? Something open to the sky? As Homer suspected and was right. A cave lit by internal fires, heated by the heart of the earth itself. Terminus is all of these things. They were moving slowly across the glacial ice, climbing the Sustrugi, building bridges over crevasses so deep they could not detect the bottom. The ice was 3,000 metres thick up here, 3 kilometres, over 9,000 feet of ice, layer after layer, millions of years. 
built slowly a few centimetres a year. The ice offered a complete record of Earth's history. It contained atmospheric pollutants from the 20th century, volcanic debris from the eruption of Krakatoa, particle recordings of the sun's activity and the early debris left over from the solar system's formation. It was like a gigantic data crystal packed with information, a laden jar the size of a continent. Peter knew this. He would speak of such things in hushed tones. They crossed a particularly wild, dry part of the Great Desert, where the waves were eight feet high and marched beyond the horizon in endless regularity, and nothing broke the surface but an occasional outcropping, the Nunatak Peak of some under-ice mountain. Near one of these, Laren slipped. It would have been a minor episode under ordinary circumstances. They were roped together after all, but there shouldn't have been such a large crevasse just on the other side of the Sestrugi. Laren was in the lead, so when she slipped, she shouted half in alarm and half in the pleasure they sometimes felt when they go to toboggan along on their stomachs like penguins before the rope pulled them up short. She flew wildly down the far side of the Sustrugi and over the smooth lip of the crevasse before she knew it. When she found herself dangling over an open space far deeper and wider than she had ever seen, her shout sopped suddenly. She dangled, turning slowly at the end of her line. Mm. Uh, that presumably is the discovery of Terminus right there. Oh, back to home, a narrative one. We viewed the hollows of what she saw. They cannot give the effect of being there, I feel sure. After all, the images are smaller and the definition lower than the real presence. Still, the images are impressive, even to me, who has access to the databanks of the world. It's, it's a shame that you are, uh, I mean, there's no hollow projector connected to this machine, so I suppose there's no way you could share it with me, is there, Homer? Sadly. Is that it? Is that our cliffhanger for this episode? I, I guess it is. I guess, uh, I guess it's kind of a literal cliffhanger, isn't it? As far as Laren's concerned. Well, there we go. We we we've got to terminus, possibly. Not much backtracking narratively this time. So, who knows? Fingers crossed. Thank you very much for joining me again for another session with Portal. Uh, I feel like we we're, we're starting to wrap things up. Hopefully. Until then, take care. Bye bye.